I'm here today to talk about the future of China. Talking about China these days um, makes me very nervous, to be frank, because there are so many people uh, who analyze this country today. Uh, I have no formal academic research to show you. Uh, I'm not an economist, I'm not a historian, I'm not even a journalist. So why do I want to get up on stage and talk about this country? Well, almost every time that I receive a visitor from the West and I ask them, what's your first impression of this country? They say, I'm blown away. I'm surprised. So it seems that in spite of all this writing about China, uh, the power of the Chinese reality still surprises people. Now, I've lived in China for more than 20 years. I was one of the first Westerners to be a radio and TV talk show host there. I founded several companies in the country, most of which failed, by the way, but one, as Anna told you, that uh, you know, uh, became one of the largest public relations firms in China with more than 200 employees. So today, I want to try to give you a few keys to understanding this country based on my own experience as an entrepreneur having lived through much of China's transformation from a poor communist country. Now, the first thing that I want to tell you is something that may sound as if I'm trying to insult your intelligence by stating the obvious. China is big. Okay, well, you all knew that, as I can hear from the laughter. Each province is the size of a country. Sichuan province has 80 million people. But not only that, each province is actually the size of a country, also as an economy. This is a map I made where I replaced the names of the Chinese provinces with names of countries that have the same GDP. So you can see that China really is big. But you already knew that, so why am I telling you this story? Well, it still seems to me that many people fail to appreciate the diversity that comes with this size. Let me give you a story here. I worked for many years with a uh, Swiss watch manufacturer selling luxury watches. Chinese people adore luxury, just like most people in Asia. But the concept of what is luxury is very different from one part of the country to another. In the south of China, in Guangdong province, people are a little bit more down to earth. They, if, even if they're buying an expensive watch, they don't want anything too ostentatious. Uh, so they'll buy something a little bit sporty, fashionable, uh, mid-priced. We put on a song and dance show with canto pop stars from Hong Kong, and we sell a lot of watches. Now, in Shanghai, uh, we had Miss Switzerland. The day after her show, in comes a guy with his girlfriend to the store, and he says, honey, which one do you like? She goes, oh, wow, nice. Mm. Yeah, I like it. that one. And the guy plonks down almost 100,000 US dollars cash for that watch. It seems to me sometimes that the way that Shanghai girls judge the quality of a future husband is by how many diamonds he can fit into a square centimeter. In the north of China, it's a little bit like where I grew up in the north of Sweden. I mean, in the real north of Sweden, not like here in Östersund, where a man is a man, we hunt, we chew tobacco, if we buy something expensive, we want it to show. So people would come out of the stores wearing these huge gold watches, walking a little bit lopsided like this, and if you ask them what time is it, they'd go, wait a minute, it's two o'clock. Right? This may sound like an anecdote, but in fact it runs through everything that I've done in China, every product that I've tried to sell, these cultural differences are huge. Not only in these respects is, is, are the cultural differences huge, but also the political climate and the economic climate between different parts of the country are very different. So China really is more of a continent than a country. That is my first point. My second point is the importance of history in modern China. And when we talk about history, we can begin with this guy, Confucius. Some of you may recognize him. We've all heard of him. But what exactly did he stand for? Well. He influences modern China in myriad ways, and I don't have time to go into each one of them here today, but one very clear example is education. Confucius believed that the path to creating a good, or as he called it, harmonious society, is through education. And because of this, the emperors instituted a so-called imperial examination system where they recruited talented people into their civil administration. So while we in Europe had a aristocracy, which was inherited from father to son. In China, the ideal has always been of a meritocracy where well-educated mandarins competed for high office. Now, the historians argue of, 
over whether or not these examinations were really that fair and how meritocratic the system is. I, I'm not an historian, so I couldn't tell you. But what I can tell you is this. The Chinese people that I meet today believe very much in this system and in this ideal. And that influences their behavior. So as soon as a Chinese family has a little bit of extra money to spend, they will invest that money in the education of their children. And of course, this focus on education is good for development in and of itself. But also, this tradition of examinations actually continues. This is what it might have looked like in Confucius' day or in the years after him. Now, this is what it looks like today. Look at these crowds. Clearly, being a bureaucrat in China still has you know, a very high cachet. The best and the brightest are attracted into the civil service. So this is the first factor historically. The second factor I'd like to bring up is China's incredibly strong market economy, market economic traditions. Recently, I visited the town of Wenzhou. It's one of those small places in China that many people in the West haven't even heard of. Uh, nine million inhabitants. Uh, I went there to have a business meeting and a friend had lent me his car. So I went down into the gar garage of my hotel and I couldn't find it because it was hidden behind all these huge Bentleys and Porsche Cayennes and Rolls Royces and what have you. My small little car just didn't show up there. Many people in Wenzhou can, can afford expensive cars because Wenzhou is the hotbed of Chinese capitalism. After only about 20 years of reforms back in the early 2000s, these guys had captured something like 30% of the world market for socks and 70% of the world's cigarette lighters were manufactured in Wenzhou. But what does that have to do with history? Well, in the 15th century, the new governor of Wenzhou wrote in his chronicle that the soil in Wenzhou is so poor that you cannot grow the mulberry tree, yet the Wenzhou businessmen are hardworking and industrious and they export the most exquisite silks. So clearly, the market tradition of China is much, much older than the last 30, 35 years of reform. This is a picture from the Ming Dynasty of a market in southern China. Confucianism, like Marxism, has always been anti-business. But in spite of this, private business has always flourished in China. I would even go so far as to say that business has become part of the Chinese national identity. So now, some of you are going to ask me, okay, you're talking about a meritocratic system and you're talking about a strong market tradition. But every day I read in the newspapers how there is corruption in the Chinese bureaucracy and how the, the, the state is squeezing out the uh, private enterprise from the market. So how do you square this circle? Well, before I answer that question, let me just be very clear here. I'm optimistic about the future of China. <coughs> But that does not mean I believe that the current political system of China is an advantage for, for the country. Quite the opposite. Corruption, for example, is a huge problem. And I also believe a democratic China would take better care of the human rights of its citizens. So that's not what I'm arguing for here. What I am saying is that if you want to understand China, you need to sometimes take two very different perspectives on the same country. Let me give you an example from my own field, the media. If I tell you, that almost all media in China are state-owned in a one-party system with heavy censorship. What's the picture you get in your heads of how the Chinese media look? Gray, boring, command and control, right? If, on the other hand, I tell you that most media in China are heavily dependent on advertising and that there are thousands of media outlets competing for audiences, then what's the picture you see? Maybe it's something like this. Voice of China. No, the latest version of American Idol in China. Fans crying outside the venues, three billion tweets to support individual heroes. And I ask you, which of these two pictures is the true picture of Chinese media today? Well, you may not be particularly attracted to either of them, but my point is that they are both equally good descriptions of what the Chinese media landscape looks like. Another example. Many people see China as a form of state capitalism. And I would argue that that is one true picture of Chinese business. Indeed, if you read the government documents, you get the impression that the state wants the state, or the government wants the state to dominate the economy. So they're putting in place 
policies like the National Champion Program, where they're trying to foster huge state-owned enterprises into globally competitive concerns. So that's one true picture of Chinese business. But there's also another picture. When I started my PR agency in China, I competed head-on against a state-owned public relations firm. And in fact, they were affiliated with the state news bureau. So you would have thought that they had huge advantages compared to a small private startup like mine. But in fact, we won. We grew much faster than they did. And when I talk about this with Chinese friends who have started billion-dollar companies with tens of thousands of employees in direct competi competition with Chinese industrial state-owned enterprises, they say exactly the same thing. They say, I'm not afraid of the state competition because those guys are just bureaucrats. It's not their money. They don't put their heart into running the business like I do. So, Nicholas Lardy has actually recently shown in a book that he published that the state of the, or the share of the state uh, in, in the Chinese economy has been going down over the last 30 years. So here's the contradiction again. The government supports state-owned enterprise, but the future of China belongs to private capitalism. Let's move on to the internet. Um, we read about how Google and uh, Facebook are censored or blocked in China and how there's heavy censorship. And that's one true picture of the Chinese internet. But you also have to remember that when I started my first company in the country 20 years ago, there was no internet in China. So my impression has been that the amount of information available to Chinese people has grown almost every year. And uh, Chinese people embrace new technology in, in a very surprising way, I think. And this is not a youth phenomenon, everybody does it. The picture here is a very ex ex interesting example of the mix of technology and tradition from this year's Chinese New Year celebrations. Uh, you know the tradition where older people in China for Chinese New Year hand over little red envelopes with money to younger generations, so grandmas and grandpas to their grandchildren. Well, this year, almost a billion such payments were made using the uh, new WeChat Hongbao function. So this is, just shows you that even older people will, will use these functions. One of the fun com companies I founded in China was a record company. Now, publishing music in China in the 1990s was very difficult because you had to get special permits and you had to have your lyrics translated into Chinese so that they could be, go through the censorship. But here's the contradiction. Our legal part of the music market was only about 5% of the total. 95% was pirated material. And the pirates, of course, they didn't have to go through any censorship process or have any approvals. They just published whatever people wanted to buy. So uh, this means that a generation of Chinese kids had access to very much the same kind of entertainment that we did in the West. I meet Many people today in China who speak excellent English, the people who speak best English usually haven't learned it at school, they've learned it from watching American uh, TV series like Friends and Desperate Housewives. So, as a record company owner, I lost lots of money to piracy. And although I'm against piracy, you know, I still have to, uh, to admit that piracy has made China a more open place by allowing more people to have access to uh, global culture. So going back to the internet, you know, we have censorship and we have tough controls, but at the, at the same time we also have lots of information that wants to be free. And you could even argue that in some ways, or in some cases, the unique challenges of China, including piracy and government control, fosters new innovative business models. You've all seen the figures, Chinese uh, e-commerce is now bigger than that in the United States, in spite of the fact that China is still a much smaller economy. In China, everybody shops online and they buy everything. Everything from clothes to groceries to prams to toilet paper. You get it delivered to your home uh, through your internet store. And some of these offerings in e-commerce are actually quite innovative. Uh, let me show you one example. This company, uh, you've heard of, of the recent uh, food scandals in China and how many people now in, worry in the middle class about the quality of the food they eat. So they want to know where it comes from. Well, this company 
uh, offers city dwellers the opportunity to rent a piece of land in the countryside and have it planted by this company with the seeds that they choose. Then you can check in on how your crop is doing over your little smartphone app. You can see the temperature, the sun sunshine, precipitation, and so on. Uh, once the crops are done, they will harvest it for you, or you can go there yourself to pick it up, but then they will harvest it for you and, and deliver it to your door. So, in essence, this company is offering Chinese office workers the opportunity to be part-time virtual farmers. So it's, it's, it's almost like a kind of game. So the, the internet is controlled by the government, but it's still a forum for very lively debate today, and the commercial space is also quite innovative. So, because China is so complex, some of you are going to tell me now, Jan, we're approaching the end of, of the speech, and why don't you give the full picture of China? Why don't you bring up so many of the problems, like we all know the environmental problems that China has, and the income disparity, and the social unrest? Why don't you talk about those? Well, China has all of these problems, and in each area, you would find the same kind of contradictions that I've been talking about here. For example, China may be the most polluted country on Earth, but still, it is also the country that invests most in renewable energy, and so on. So let me just close with a story which illustrates why I think all of this is so important. In 1990, I visited the Pudong area, which is the green spot over there on the other side of the Shanghai River in Shanghai. And, um, you know, at that time it was paddy fields. We were being guided by a local party secretary who said, over there is our new high-rise finance center, and over in that direction is going to be our biotech zone. We were standing there in our rubber boots, trying to avoid stepping on the frogs, and we laughed ourselves silly behind this guy's back and said, he is a total state-planning megalomaniac. Well, today, of course, I'm no longer laughing, because this is what it looks like today. In fact, if I had been a smarter businessman, I would have bought some plots of land and sold it to the guys who built, built these skyscrapers. So, we in the West, need to become better at understanding in depth what's going on in China. Because in spite of all its problems, this country will continue to grow and develop. And because of its unique history, its unique culture, and the challenges that the country is facing, it, this growth is bound to continue to surprise us. If we're going to understand the future of China, we need to be able to embrace the contradictions of this country. Thank you. <laughs>